Welcome to another pre-show, all you patrons. Gather round. Indeed, indeed. And it has been three long weeks since last you gathered here at this, this temple of understanding, this grove of serenity, this, this garden of juniper and cypress trees. <laughs> uh, well, whatever it is, welcome. Welcome. It's been too long. We missed you. you. We hope you missed us. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. It'd be kind of sad. I mean, if they didn't miss us, it would sort of make all of this kind of pointless. And I want to I want to uh, uh, congratulate all the gentlemen on their seersucker and linen suits, the ladies on their their long light dresses and their summer hats. I uh, a, a better a better gathering of the internet's aristocrats should be hard put to find than our patrons. Agreed. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that should sm- snow them for the week, huh? What? <laughs> yeah, what? excellent job. Excellent Who? job, Charles. Thank that's, you. that's why we pay you the big bucks. That's um, for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> I am, boy, am I, am I appreciative. They can't see it right now because all they can see is the little the little bit of Studio B behind you and my room here in Trumont. But throughout the Tumblr House Tower, even as we speak, there are cocooned <laughs> summer employees in their, in their annual estimation, <laughs> removed from all worry or care. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we're... It's a problem. It's a problem because there's so much um, fibrous material left over. We're we're actually engaging in sort of like a a renewal, a recycling plan. Like, what do we do with this? Like, do we we can't just throw this in the trash, you know? No, no. I I I think the autumn bonfire. The autumn bonfire. Uh, The uh, Valpugis knock? No, that was spring. Uh, Halloween with the. uh, well, Halloween, when the, uh, by that time, everybody will have emerged from their cocoons. And uh, we can just make a big pile of the, I don't know if you'd call it silk. It's flammable anyway. So, you know, it's a good thing there's no smoking in the building right, right now. All those, all those wrapped shapes that go up in flames. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll see. I don't know. It's hard to do bonfires in California. You know, everyone's sensitive about about things you know there's a lot of we have well, to save the environment you know uh there's a lot of snitches it, too it, a lot of snitches oh, that's for sure that's, <laughs> that's 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 yeah you know that that's one line ladies and gentlemen and this came up during COVID as well you know generally you won't hear me quote uh the friend of mine who is associated with a let's call it a youth group down in long beach I think I think that's the best way to describe yeah. it, a youth group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's one of my favorite uh, lines of his, and I want to quote it. I don't think he watches the show. If he does, he'll be tickled uh, that I quoted him. But and he'd be even more tickled that I named neither him nor the organization. But but the motto, and this is what I want to give everybody who's trying to lead decent, pleasant lives that involve oh, I don't know, smoking tobacco or having that extra drink or, or whatever, just having a barbecue in the backyard and setting off a few fireworks. Here it is. Stop snitching. Stop. St- I, I thought you were going to say snitches get stitches. <laughs> no, that would imply a threat. Okay, stop snitching. Stop snitching. Now, very often, that's followed up by another sentence, not entirely dissimilar from the one you offered. But I'm not, I'm not going to say that. Oh, okay. That would be a, a, I, I can't say it's a gentlemanly because I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to reflect on the nature of people who issue uh, helpful hints like that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stitches get stitches. Uh, again, it's not a it's not a sentiment I would necessarily want to endorse, but I can understand where it comes from, the the socioeconomic and cultural influences that generate it. Yeah, 
I mean, you know, I feel like another way to say it is just respect people's privacy. That's that's yeah, that's, that's <laughs> even, even better. That's even better, I think. You know, uh, I, I remember back in the old days, you used to talk people to talk about taking people for a trip to the fine banks. I let's not go there, ladies and gentlemen. Let's never make ourselves prospective candidates for rides out to the pond, up to the Pine Barrens. Yes. All right, that's uh, good. Uh, you know, they still haven't found Jimmy Hoffa. You think they will ever find Jimmy Hoffa? I have it on really good authority they're not likely to. You might say that he's sort of the... Right now, he's part of the foundational element of a prominent structure. I see. Okay. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, it happens, you know. I mean, sometimes someone's there and then sometimes they're gone. No one knows what happens. What happens? They just disappear. No, no, I... I mean, it's, it's like the uh, the original uh, version of uh, Mac the Knife, which is not nearly as nice as the English version. And there's one verse that goes, uh, there's a gas fire uh, down in Soho. Seven children at one go. Mackie's standing in the crowd, but he's not asked and doesn't know. Mm. The the Mackie Messer, the Mac the Knife of the German three penny opera, or is is not not a nice person. Not yeah. like you know the one we we hear about in our version. Yeah, our version is kind of a lovable rogue, you know. Oh, the shark bites hey with its teeth. Yeah, hey, scarlet billows start to spread. Yeah. Hmm. Fancy gloves has old Mac Heath made. So there's never, never a trace of red. Well, that sounds kind of jaunty and jolly, you know. Yeah. Roguish. Yeah. Whereas the little German version, he's offing children. I swear, I'm getting everything mixed up in my head because I could, I could swear that maybe in 1989, 1990, when... Um, Annunciation, our, our local parish, had they, they put on, um, I, I don't know how to say it, like shows. They put on shows, like skit, yeah. skits and stuff like that and different things. I thought someone was out in the crowd seeing uh, Mac the Knife or something like that. Yeah. 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 I remember that very well. <laughs> okay. That just seems weird. That just seems weird. I don't know. For a what? parish? I don't know. <laughs> Well, that just shows you how the character back the knife in the American version was so sanitized. Yeah. Whereas in the original German, <laughs> it's horrible, absolutely horrible. Wow. But you know that's that's Bertolt Brecht for you. We, we I was telling because uh, my sister was here um, the summer, and um, I was telling her what you told everyone on the show. <clears throat> which is uh like little uh, like like that's what we do to some of these uh, a lot of things i guess we sanitize them cuz little red riding yep. hood all these other sure. stories we, we we just sanitize them um yeah well we or if you like we disnify them disney well, we, you know that that's a perfect term because obviously um what was top of mind as well was little mermaid uh yeah which, which has a horrible ending in the Hans Christian Andersen yeah. version. But yeah. in the Disney version, is sweet and loving. But, uh, you know, again, Disney, without wanting to bag on him too much, uh, he knew his audience. You know, and the American audience did not want unhappy endings. And so he would very often uh, soften or sanitize things. Uh, so that the audiences would attend, and they, and it was wildly successful. I mean, Walt, Walt Disney, and this is going to sound a little weird, maybe, but to me, Walt Disney is almost the ultimate American. 
That doesn't sound weird. Well, and and, and also, I don't say it. Uh, I don't say it. Um, what's the word? I don't say it to be insulting either. Because it's got strengths and weaknesses, if you see what I mean. There's good and bad to it. Uh, yeah, self-made man with a dream. and um, oh, So what are the qualities you're attaching to that statement? Well, uh, take Disneyland as a whole. Look at its emphases. Fantasyland, Tomorrowland, uh, Adventureland, uh, Frontierland. Uh, Main Street USA, which is the jumping off point for each of these. Each of these are worlds of the American imagination. The world tomorrow, Tomorrowland, the future. Frontierland is our, and New Orleans Square is our own past, which we've romanticized and turned into something unusual. Uh, Adventureland is the exotic and the bizarre, and that's, you know, Africa, Asia, Hawaii conflated. The same, the same sort of thing that gave you tiki bars with rum drinks and Chinese food. You know, that existed nowhere in the world except America. <laughs> but it was, it, 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 it brought together different things that in their own places would have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> Not because they hated each other, but because they just weren't anywhere. To, you know, it, it, it would be like a, a polar bear in the Brazilian rainforest. Well, normally these two would not go together. But if it had worked out that both of these were symbols of the exotic, then in America, you would see polar bears in the Brazilian rainforest, hmm. you know, which, which would never happen. Yeah, of course. But if, if that was an image in our psyche, in our collective American thing, well, then, then you'd see all sorts of polar bear and jungle deals going, uh, which is why, you know, Chinese food and Mandarin rum drinks and, and Hawaiian motifs. There, it 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 doesn't really necessarily fit for the cultural purist, but tiki was a uniquely American thing that was produced uh, by Americans, and then of course as, exported to Europe and Canada and other places where it made even less sense. But at any rate, so you see that in uh, you see that in. Uh, uh, Disneyland, and then you see Fantasyland, which is that part of the American imagination that deals really with old Europe and with the foundational stories and tales that are, uh, again, part of our collective imagination and memory. They represent the old world our fathers came from. And all of these different themes dance around in the American mind and notice the center of them, the world of our grandfathers or our great-grandfathers, Main Street, USA, which is Walt Disney's boyhood home, really. And that's why I think he had such a, a winning formula, both in terms of not just the amusement parks, but the films, uh, the cartoons, everything. He knew his audience. Uh, you, you, look at, you look at the Disney songbook, um, and uh, you, when you wish upon a star, which is sort of the national anthem of Disneyland, is an extremely American sentiment, I think. Mm. Yeah, uh, we're we're always looking for a happy ending, and we're always pushing and driving and trying and striving in the certain belief that we'll make it if uh, we just have luck and pluck enough. You know, it, it's so interesting because um, I'm going to kind of make a weird connection, but um, I, th I I was watching I I was watching Star Wars Episode Four, New Hope, the old version. I haven't watched that in like 25 years or something like that. Um, you mean the the original Star Wars? The original, the original. Yeah. And I was just looking at the, the storytelling elements of it and thinking about it and you know this and and i want to hone in on the concept of the force like just use the force it's it's this quasi kind of well i i don't know if it's quasi but the spiritual element there there's this sort of 
it's they call it religion in in the in the series but um yeah and then so i don't know tying that with this when you wish upon a star thing that's almost like a prayer to god except it's, almost it's not like, uh, it's, it's not. secular it's 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 secular it's prayerful in a sense i yeah. mean let's let's look at the lyrics for a second uh, because it's actually it's it's it, like religion, but not. You, you, you know it, what it, it is? It's spiritual, but not religious. That's well, the indeed. connection I'm making between Star Wars and and that. And here are the here are the here are these. Uh, and this here are the lyrics of uh, "When You Wish Upon a Star." When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. If your heart is in your dream, no request is too extreme. When you wish upon a star, as dreamers do, fate is kind. She brings to those who love the sweet fulfillment of their secret longing. Like a bolt out of the blue, fate steps in and sees you through. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. So fate becomes a kind of, of deity here. Mm. And it's also like, dare I, I hate to bring up that other most American of things, Alcoholics Anonymous. But think of the higher power. Yeah, so you have to acknowledge your higher power in that. Which could be anything. Yeah. So the higher power doesn't have to be God. Well, what's higher? <laughs> I mean, like... well, oh, funny you should ask. <laughs> and let let's go to AA, higher power. You know, like to to me, there's not a lot of options there. <laughs> well, that's because you're a Catholic. You see, you're not a real, a true blue American. Oh. Uh, AA, higher power, atheists. Okay, there's Psych Central. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. This this is an official thing from AA. So, uh, my name is Charles, and I'm a heavy drinker. All right. This is a uh, pamphlet of theirs, The God Word, Agnostic and Atheist Members in AA. So, he makes this point. AA is not a religious organization. Alcoholics Anonymous has only one requirement for membership, and that is the desire to stop drinking. Uh, there is room in AA for people of all shades of belief and non-belief. Uh, the uh, so the thing is that you're your different versions. Uh, The, uh, yeah, here we go. This is typical. Uh, gradually as time went on, I came to believe there's something within me that guides me through life and looks after me. I don't know who or what it is, but I'm convinced there's quote unquote something. Sometimes I call it God simply because it's one syllable and it slips off the tongue easily. I still consider myself an agnostic, an agnostic though. Uh, and the the higher power it could be anything. It could be the other members of the program. Uh, ah, for instance, like this. Uh, I did realize, however, that I had a faith all along, not in a magic man of the sky, but in the power of nature. If I cut my hand, the cut will heal all by itself as long as I keep it clean. Uh, the uh, and then there's this one. My higher power is very much the love and wisdom I find in the rooms of AA and the beautiful things I see while walking in nature. I have no problem in using the word God with or without a capital G. Uh, an atheist in recovery. 
Uh, he says, uh, uh, yeah, this fellow, she asked, I told my sponsor, it felt like I had a guardian angel. She asked if it could be my higher power, God even. I said, I prefer to think it was the power of the rooms and the support of the people in them. And so it goes. Uh, it, it, the, the higher power of AA is anything you need it to be to help you stop drinking. Mm. Yeah. Which is not unlike the force of Star Wars or the fate yeah. of Jiminy Cricket. Yeah, the force is kind of like this this natural thing too, right? Like, oh, it's like this this no, nature. It's thing. it's very much like uh, the Tao. The Taoism. Oh, you know, it's the, the the rule that goes through everything. The law that it says it's impersonal and so on and so forth. Or like heaven itself in a lot of versions of Chinese religion, yeah. which is again not personal. Yeah, the uh, I mean, <laughs> over in here in California, you know, you have a lot of friends of different various persuasions, and one thing I keep hearing is um, and, and none and none. And, 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 none. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I keep hearing is the universe is trying to tell me, like the universe is right. That's a big one, right? Like that. <laughs> that is a real big one. You know, <laughs> over the universe here. is trying to. The universe is trying to get you in touch with the best version of yourself. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, could the universe leave me a note that I'll pick it up in the morning? <laughs> Maybe it could leave my the best version of myself's address uh, uh, in a little <laughs> note, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll go visit the best version of myself. I mean, you know, and the funny thing is, ladies and gentlemen, we'll make fun of these things, but the truth is that a lot of people take this stuff very seriously. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you that, for instance, our Wiccan friends, whom we think of as uh, neo-pagans, um, or neo-pagans themselves, you know, we think of them as believing the heathen deity in the heathen deities of old, but with a lot of them, that's not true. Uh, several of them, several folk of this persuasion have told me that. They don't really believe in the deities as such, but they see them as aspects of their own personality. That's weird. Okay, that's hard to. I know it's weird. Okay. Don't ask me to, to give you to shed any more light on it than that. But the American mentality very much tends to go in that direction, you know, and it 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 has a very. Um, nebulous side to it which is interesting because it's married to being very activist and as i say i think both aa on the one hand and walt disney on the other are great examples of both right hmm. and again you know it would be false to say that there hadn't been any benefits to all this stuff uh i think it's one reason why americans are so pushy and and you know get things done and are impatient with being told you can't about anything. Uh, and I, I think that's something that to a great degree we share with the, the other settler countries, you know, Canada and Mexico and Cuba and Brazil and Argentina and Australia and New Zealand, et cetera, et cetera. Because all of us, after all, um, we came from the Europeans who didn't fit in. Right. All right, um, let's do some questions. This was we're off to a great start. We're at the twenty-four minute mark, and we haven't asked a question yet, which I think is a record for the pre-show. But um, let's get to the All questions. Right, well, it's, yeah, it's been fun. Plus, remember we've had three weeks we've had to go without the show. Right. I don't think it's don't think it's only habit forming for you guys, ladies and gentlemen. When we don't do the show, uh, believe me, Vinny and I miss it as much as you do. Absolutely. So. Because we don't we don't get to chit chat like this normally. When you consider that I knew young Vinny as a six year old, his first day at school, I'll never forget Vinny looking up at me and saying, "Can I have a switchblade of my own, Uncle Charles?" 
And I said, in time, son, in time. Mm. Isn't that a touching memory? That's so sweet. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's funny. Uh, my my mom has... <laughs> wow, Charles. Um What? No, I'm actually quoted uh, on the first day of school by my mom, where I apparently said, uh, "I can't go to school, mom. I don't know how to read." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, that's true. So you did say that. <laughs> so I, I felt very insecure about not knowing how to read yet. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, you know, I, I can't go to Latin class. I don't speak it. What? <laughs> <laughs> well. It's but no, I, I uh, gosh, that's so long ago. You went to is there uh, you you went to IC right? No, I went to Annunciation. Annunciation, rather, yeah, yeah. Annunciation. Uh, does do they still have a school? No, it closed down ten years ago. I think they rented out to um, some sort of prep. I think. I mean, the buildings are still there, and other people use it, but they're just renting them out. Well, no feel too bad. They closed Blessed Sacrament School in Hollywood about for four, three or four years ago, my yeah. alma mater. And the Jesuits are leaving after since 1914 uh, in Hollywood at Blessed Sacrament. The Jesuits are packing up their troubles in their old kit bag and moving on out. And BS is going to become a, uh, a diocesan parish. And I can't tell you how much I'll miss the Jesuits. You. you... <laughs> oh, I, I can't tell I, you. I know. I. <laughs> like, I really can't. <laughs> I have no means of saying how much I'll miss them. Wow. Bye bye. <sighs> You know what we used to say when uh, in the sixties when they were getting really wild with the mass. What? What are the only two things that will never change at a Jesuit mass? I don't know what. The bread and the wine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's... <sighs> wow. Okay. Well, you know, as my late father said in those far off days, when you act stupid, people will make fun of you and you shouldn't be offended. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. I know. I know. I know. We, we should publish a book of your dad's quotes. That's so good. Um, yeah. When you, that, I mean, I, look, if you... If you sat at the desk where you are right now, dressed like Bozo the Clown, I guarantee you, you'd lose a certain amount of authority in the eyes of our <laughs> patrons and viewers. I, I, I mean, believe me, you would. Yeah. You, please don't test me on this one. No, absolutely not. No. And you, and you know, it wouldn't matter that it had taken three hours to get you into the clown makeup and do it just so, till you looked exactly like Bozo, and that you had you you paid God knows how much for a professional makeup lady to do it it wouldn't help uh, very true charles and instead of saying patrons gather out you said hi boys and girls we're gonna have a lot of fun today while it would definitely alter the 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 atmosphere of the show somewhat the whole ambiance would change i don't think it would do so for the better I don't think I would dress up as a clown. I, I would rather like like Barney the dinosaur or maybe Smoochie. Yeah, I, I would Smoochie like that. Smoochie was a clown. I, I, he wasn't a clown. He was a dinosaur. He was not a clown. How was it? So he got Death, killed. Death to Smoochie. I don't. Did he get killed? I don't think he got killed. They wanted to kill him because. <laughs> well, what would guess so? From because. The title? <laughs> <laughs> because the mob was running, um, what is it, Rainbow something, and it, it was the dirty, the the dirty underworld of uh, kids shows, and the mafia was actually running it because people would pay underneath the table, under the table, uh, for their kid to get special 
a place of prominence on the show. And so there's this giant... <laughs> there's this gi but then Smoochie came in and he wouldn't... He wouldn't bow down to the mafia. So they had to kill him. <laughs> so they had to kill him. It's actually a really good movie, I thought. Your, um, your great uncle wasn't an advisor on the show, was he? <laughs> no. I'm, just cur I'm just curious. No, you know, no. a technical advisor, maybe. Well, <laughs> hmm. All right. All right. Let's do some questions. Slip sync ships. L yeah. Less said, at least said earlier, best, at least said soonest meant it. Fine. All right. Uh, Helvicio says, I'm curious what Charles thinks about Mortimer J. Adler. It's almost shocking that he managed to be a Jew and a Thomist for such a long time before converting to the Catholic faith. In a way, he reminds me of Ben Shapiro. Well, where do I start? Mortimer Adler was a brilliant man and like so many brilliant men, was a very proud man. Uh, you ask, how could, uh, how could he be a Thomas so long without finally converting? Well, of course, he did come in, number one. That's the, the most important thing about Mortimer Adler, is that he did come into the church before he died. So, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what matters. Uh, and for some people, it's a longer journey. For others, it's a shorter one. Obviously, the sooner the better, but better late than never. I'm just filled with old sayings tonight. Uh, but the fact remains that highly intellectual people often uh, believe that they can accept uh, philosophical premises without any relation to religion. Now, ultimately, this isn't really possible. Not if you want to have a valid philosophy. And that that is, I mean, basically for Adler, one of two things had to go uh, in his pursuit of truth. One was his disbelief uh, or the other uh, or the other was his logic. Um, but that he was able to keep it up so long, I think, is inherent, if not in Thomism, but certainly in a lot of Thomisms, plural. Uh, and I think it was best brought out by a biographer of St. Bonaventure who distinguished the two, the two thinkers, St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas, who were good friends, by the way. But he distinguished their approaches by saying uh, St. Bonaventure with St. Thomas, he saw God at the summit of all things. St. Bonaventure saw all things in their relationship to God. And basically, what you find with a lot of followers of St. Thomas, and for that matter, Aristotle, um, a number of them like to go on about philosophy as though religion did not exist. Um, there is no need to consider revelation um, in the light of, how do I put it? For a lot of a lot of non-Catholic Thomists, the idea is that you could be a Thomist, you could follow the philosophical element while ignoring the religious. Now, ultimately, I don't believe that to be true. I believe it's a disservice to St. Thomas, and I think uh, Mortimer Adler's final destination points that out. But it's an illusion that a number of people have been able to do for varying lengths of time and certainly for a good while he was able to but thank god in the end he couldn't hmm. all right uh question from jeff says uh i'd really like to hear a discussion about the infiltration of communism into the u.s government and culture uh, i recently picked up whitaker chambers's big book witness and find it quite enlightening I'm guessing you have strong opinions one way or the other. Communism and its lasting effects concerns me. I'm 67, so I recall the days of preparing in school for at atomic raids in my youth. Thinking as an adult, I'm not sure what ducking under a desk would do to help the situation should such a bomb be dropped. But that's what we did. 
For me, it's an interesting topic. Have we moved here in the USA from communist influence to socialism to progressivism to a battle between progressivism and populism? Maybe an obvious question with an obvious answer. That's a question, but I'd really like to hear a discussion about Whitaker Chambers and communism back in those days. We tend to forget where the roots are buried. That's a very, very good question. And of course, I myself remember the duck and cover drills. And I, I remember thinking that when I'd be crouching under my desk, thinking, I don't know that this would really help a lot. <laughs> you know, if they dropped an atom bomb in LA, I think here in Hollywood would be kind of vaporized. Uh, so I didn't really, I mean, I did them because you'd be punished if you didn't, but it didn't occur to me they'd be all that, all that helpful. However, it did give people the illusion of control. And that, uh, as you saw with COVID, is extremely important. Uh, the idea, especially on the part of government, the idea that there's something you can do that'll make a difference. Uh, psychologists, you know, we have earthquakes in, uh, in Los Angeles. You may not have realized this, Vinny, but we do. And some psychologists say that when an earthquake is hitting, and you know, you're wherever you're writing it out, you should point, you know, shake your finger at it and tell it to stop. And of course, it will stop, but it gives you a feeling as though you somehow maintain some sort of control over it. I don't know that I would feel that way, but that's I, usually by the time the earthquake's over, I'm too too busy praying to worry about that. But at any rate, uh, the the illusion of control is an important one for governments. So that was why, uh, and it's reassuring for children, you know, rather than the kids worrying about whether or not they'll be burned to a crisp, they've got something to do if anything did happen, which. I think that's kind of good. And I, I don't, children are so easily influenced. I was, um. At the company, we hired a new person who um, – she's very young, like 20 – I don't know, 23 or something like that. But she was explaining to me how um, COVID messed up young people so badly in so many different ways. So I don't know – I don't know if it's a good connection, but um, I think at least back in the day, it's a good – Perhaps it was a good thing for people's mental health to, you know, like, that was a consideration. Like, oh, you have control. Like, you don't have to worry. Um, whereas now it's like, yeah, you have to worry because you don't have control. So you have to put your mask on. You have to get vaccinated. You have to do all these things. Um, and, then, no. and, then even, and then even then, maybe you're still going to get got. You know? And the yeah, and, and bear in mind too that for us moderns, what we've been taught constantly is the worst thing that can ever happen is death. Yeah. And and that's and that's what our leaders believe. Yeah. You know, to the to the degree that they have any any belief in anything. But anyway, that's all a side note. The question of Whitaker Chambers and communist infiltration in the United States is an interesting one. And I'm old enough to remember when it was a, a burning question. Um, you know, we used to have the um, all sorts of people from the John Birch Society to the Dan Smoot reports to the, um, oh, golly, the um, Dean Mannion uh, Dean Mannion uh, you, you had all these different anti-communist Clarence Mannion, uh, Dean. He lived until '79, but he had a uh, uh, he had an anti-communist uh, uh, thing. Yeah, the Mannion Forum. Uh, and we had, uh, you know, uh, Dan Smoot reports. I think was one of them. Uh, yeah, the Dan Smoot Report, which was um, died in 2003, former FBI man, 
Uh, he chronicled from 57 to 71, he published the Dan Smoot Report, which chronicled alleged communist infiltration in various sectors of American government and society. Well, you know, you, you have a lot to unpack in all of this, because certainly, on the one hand, we know of a certainty that the Soviet Union, uh, through the KGB, used Native Americans. I don't mean Indians on the reservation. I mean uh, Native-born Americans to further their goal of destabilizing American society. And there was a lot that they pushed from educational incompetence to uh, sexual immorality to all kinds of other good stuff that was intended to destabilize America and make us a less formidable opponent. The problem we get into, and I don't have a solution for it, you also have trends in society that operate, in a sense, independently. And then you also have the fact that communism, like fascism, like Nazism, like our own wokery, was simply one facet of modernity, which is all these things. The proof of the pudding is that post-Soviet Russia has tried to, so far, in many ways, unsuccessfully, has tried to struggle against the modernity they inherited from communism. Uh, Putin knows, for instance, uh, that abortion and contraception are destroying his people. But he finds himself powerless, for whatever reason, to really fight it. The average Russian lady has had four abortions. Can you imagine the demographic health of Russia if those children were born? Hmm. Now, that's why I say it, it, it becomes very difficult to identify what is modernity, what is actual communist infiltration, and what is simply the way things are going. Bearing in mind that in all three cases, you do have the arch conspirator, the father of lies, Satan himself. And of course, all of us cooperate with him whenever we sin, and especially when we sin mortally. Um, you know, I, I, I had a, um, an interesting thing. Uh, somebody wrote me and asked, do you think Joe Sixpack would ever, would ever accept a monarchy. And what I did not send back was that Joe Sixpack doesn't want to stop killing babies. I mean, not the majority of Joe Sixpack. Because they give him the freedom to, um, shall we say, sow his seed wherever he likes without, without any consequences. I mean, the devil seduces us, you know, through our pleasures. He doesn't seduce us through virtue. <laughs> yeah, I, that, it's been especially frustrating because I'm sure you've had this where you're advising someone and there's a choice between two things. And you advise them to go the good direction, right? And it's just staggering how many people I'm watching where I give them advice and then it just goes the other way. It's just like... Well, they go the other way because the other way is either more pleasant or easier or will get them something they think they want. I know, I know. Yeah, the... okay, I won't go into tangent, well, but yeah. Well, no, but I mean, you you know yourself when you go to confession. Yeah. The the best way to understand people is to meditate on your own confessions. <laughs> it's very true. Very true. <laughs> well, the, this is where you know my my old joke was always the only thing that allows me to tolerate my fellow man is realizing I'm just like him. <laughs> but if it weren't for that, the reign of terror that I would unleash. <laughs> yeah. But it is, it is, I mean, it's, it's a problematic thing. Um, but certainly so much in the immediate. Now, we, 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 we went up to the great 
you know, the great uh, uh, macrocosm, but bring it back down to the period that our friend is talking about. Oh, uh, yeah, there was a great deal of that stuff. Uh, I think I've, I've spoken on the show before how when I was a boy in Hollywood, we'd all heard the rumor that the uh, uh, the uh, newsstand at Hollywood and Cuenca was a KGB drop. We'd all heard that, and we all thought it was ridiculous. Well, the Soviet Union falls. And, you know, we were saying, well, what, are they, what are they stealing? Movie scripts? You know, the, the Soviet Union falls, the KGB files are opened, and guess what? It was indeed a KGB drop, but it wasn't movie scripts. It was aerospace secrets in the San Fernando Valley. Well, I'll be. Well, <laughs> note that beat all. <laughs> Why? Well, I haven't heard anything that wild in a month of Sundays. <laughs> Gee, Paul. <laughs> Wow, you you just you just took the whole show into the the direction of hee haw. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Who's our musical guest anyway? <laughs> Tammy Wynette. <laughs> Stand by your man. Actually, I'd like to hear uh, the coal miner's daughter. Yeah. I yeah. I'm not familiar with that song. Really? Can you sing it? I, I maybe I know it. I just don't know the name. It sounds I, familiar. I can't sing. I can't sing Coal Miner's Daughter. It'll be ridiculous. But I give you some of the lyrics. Okay. I uh, uh, coal miners, not gold miners' daughter. Yeah, no coal that, miner. That would be coal, gold miners' daughter. Would be a song about a Hollywood producer's uh, daughter, Loretta Lynn, the coal miner's daughter. Lyrics. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. From Miss Loretta Lynn, the coal miner's daughter. And it goes like, so it's actually very touching, and I make fun, but it's really, it's a lovely little song. She says, well, I was born to a coal miner's daughter in a cabin on a hill in Butcher Holler. That's a place in Kentucky, far east Kentucky. We were poor, but we had love. That's the one thing that daddy made sure of. He shoveled coal to make a poor man's dollar. My daddy worked all night in the Van Leer coal mines, all day long in the field of hoeing corn. Mommy rocked the babies at night and read the Bible by the coal oil, by the coal oil light, and everything would stall all over come break of morn. Daddy loved and raised eight kids on a miner's pay. Mommy scrubbed our clothes on a washboard on a washboard every day. Why I've seen her fingers bleed to complain there was no need. She'd smile in Mommy's understanding way. In the summertime, we didn't have shoes to wear, but in wintertime, we'd all get a brand new pair from a mail-order catalog, money made from selling a hog. Daddy always managed to get the money somewhere. Yeah, I'm proud to be a coal miner's daughter. I remember well the well where I drew water. The work we done was hard. At night, we'd sleep because we were tired. Never thought of ever leaving Butcher Holler. Well, a lot of things have changed since way back then. Ah, and it's so good to be back home again. Not much left but the floors. Nothing lives here anymore, except the memories of a coal miner's daughter. Wow. Very good. All right. Now, I mean, that's another side of America, in addition to Disney and all the rest of it. What? The, being a... Being a coal miner's daughter. No, the, the, the whole the country western uh, hard times kind of thing. How come, how come Disney didn't go in? I mean, I guess kind of they did. W where does the Wild West fit into the Disney, you know? Oh, fr Frontierland. Frontierland. That's right. That's right. Okay. Daniel Boone, David Crockett. That's right. The rivers of America opening the West. I guess what I was thinking was it's not so much gunfights as much as frontiersmen. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you want you want uh, gunfights, you've got to head on over, uh, saddle up and head on over to Universal Studios. Yeah, that's for sure. 
it, it, that was actually amazing. That that was such a revelation because when you you go through the you're you're going through uh, on the tram through the studios, and uh, they have their cowboy town, like their their Wild West town, and yeah. the the first thing that stood out to me was it was smaller. It was like slightly smaller in an uncomfortable way, and I was like, why is it so small? Why, why, I don't understand. It seems weird. I guess, you know, it's to make people appear larger actors. than life. You know, like Alan Ladd, right? Like, I think he was a yeah, small Yeah, they were short. They were short. <laughs> and so was, uh, I mean, these people were short people. And then, uh, what's his face? Tom Cruise. Well, you know, he's, well, he's got to stand on a box. Okay, well, I don't think I've seen Tom Cruise in a Western. I don't think he's been in a Western. But... Well, he was in one. It was that, one, that uh, thing about Oklahoma where he plays an Irishman with a horrendous throat. And, uh, oh, far, he, far and away. Of, You're right. Far and away. Yeah. That's the one. That's so it. I think, I think, I, I can't think he's done any other Westerns. No, I don't think so. Okay. But it, I thought that I was funny. Cowboys versus aliens, maybe. I felt like they're lying to me. They're, they're being, <laughs> Hollywood is being dishonest. Oh, 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 <laughs> really? Oh, I feel so. I wish I'd been on the tour with you. You know, I have. I'd have comforted you. I'd have said something helpful like, grow up, kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, don't be such a loser. <laughs> really, Uncle Charles? Yeah. <laughs> I'd have been comforting, you know. <laughs> but why is it, why, it's not real. Of course not, kid, it's a fraud. Don't you understand that? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I feel like all my dreams have been torn away. Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, all right. We've got one last question for the pre-show, which kind of dovetails nicely into uh, the previous question, uh, which is what are your thoughts on Senator Joseph McCarthy and – who are some of Charles's favorite United States senators? Wow. Both good questions. Well, uh, you know, Tailgater Joe, as they called him, um, I have two different views of. One was my dad's, who was, you know, my father was a very, how do I put it? Well, of course, he was a contemporary of what was going on. And he was a tail gunner like Joseph McCarthy. So uh, I think he understood McCarthy in ways that some of the people who weren't tail cutters in the Pacific <laughs> possibly would not not necessarily relate to. Uh, but seeing that they both had the same uh, the same uh, usually it'll kill you job, and both of them came out of it in one piece. Uh, I, I've always thought my father's opinion of Joe McCarthy was worth hearing, and it was simply that. A lot of the charges he made were true, but he made them on insufficient evidence. And that was, in my father's humble opinion, a huge mistake. Because he ended up discrediting himself and everything he did. Whereas if he had, you know, stuck to what he could actually prove and not gone all over the place, you know. But he said perhaps uh, doing that was endemic either or both to his personality and to the job, because one of the things about being a U.S. senator on a, on a crusade is it, it's, it's kind of like having going for clickbait today, if you get what I mean. In yeah, other words, all eyes if on you're, you. yeah, and and if if you need clickbait, you'll 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 say anything or do anything to get it. Well, very often a senator on a crusade, and we see this in a lot of different things. Uh, going after the mafia, going after Hollywood, uh, going after uh, uh, climate change. And I'm thinking now, what's his face? The uh, Inconvenient Truth Man, uh, Gore. Uh, before he was vice president, when he was Senator Gore, he made that his big crusade. And, and now and, uh, I'm not talking about whether or not there's climate change, whether or not there was a heavy mafia influence whether or not Hollywood was corrupt, whether or not there were evil music, uh, evil lyrics and music. I'm talking about the technique of senatorial crusades. And the thing is, uh, you know, if you, one, you want to get reelected, 
Two, you want to stay as a result in the public eye. Three, you want to keep getting funded for your, your crusade. So you've got to be kind of sensationalist. Uh, you've got to get, kind of go for clickbait. And that's why I say uh, the less reputable parts of what McCarthy did might be attributed either or both to his personality or to the very nature of senatorial crusades. So that's one thing. Now, setting all that aside, uh, I knew a group of people who for many years organized an annual requiem for uh, Joe McCarthy, and a number of them knew him personally. And they thought he was a, a wonderful man. Now, I didn't know him, they did. Uh, but I, I wonder, they still do the uh, McCarthy Requiem? I don't know. Uh, let me, uh, this is a little bit funny, you know, we're, we're covering Disney, the coal miner's daughter, and Joseph McCarthy. Who says we don't do Americana on this show? Huh? Uh, but the, uh, the Requiem Mass was a big annual deal in New York. Um, uh, for a long time. I don't know if they still do it. Uh, let's see. Requiem Mass, Joseph McCarthy. Uh, Washington Digital. That's 1957. That's no great, no great deal. Uh, Yeah, well, in uh, in 2020, um, New York, uh, do they they still do it? I don't know if they still do it, but I know they were doing it as late as the uh, 20 teens. So. Anyway, that's uh, so I would say he, he, he uh, left kind of a mixed bag. I wish, frankly, and this is my father's wish, that he had been more prudent in what he did in order to avoid being discredited. Yeah. So, but that does allow me to segue neatly into my favorite senators. Well, the first thing you got to bear in mind is that there has been a huge change in the nature of the Senate. Prior to 1912, Senators were chosen by the state governments of the uh, the constituent states of the American Union. After that year, they were directly elected by the people. Now, this inevitably lowered the uh, number one kind of lowered the uh, quality to a great degree of the of the senators we had. What's the science behind that? Well, there's several things. Firstly. Uh, before, the senators were really the ambassadors of the state to the federal government. And they were answerable to the state government. So in other words, uh, the state government of California sends two senators to Washington. And they have to represent the interests of, the Cal of California in the Senate. And if they don't, uh, the, then the government will pull them out. State government well, will, well, will well to, to, to what extent, I, I, I guess the first question that begs is to what extent it would were the senators just lackeys of the state government then? Like puppets. Well, that was their job, you see. Uh, diplomats are, are puppets of their government. So you got to remember that the Constitution uh, envis envisaged a union made up of sovereign states. The state, well, the, the, to this day, the, you are a citizen of the United States by virtue of being a citizen of a state. That's why if you're in Puerto Rico or American Samoa or Guam or whatever, you can't vote for president. And why people in D.C. couldn't vote for president until 1962. Okay, I, I, I guess I, I'm just coming at it from a very modern uh, lens in terms of looking at the state of California and thinking, Okay, uh, the California senators, or the the senators are now picked from what is uh, the states uh, assembly or, so, or what did you say? 
they would well, they would be they would be depending on the state because there was no yeah. it varied from state to state how they were chosen. Could, Some were elect. What's that? Because you said the states um, are are filled up with a bunch of losers. That that's the people who can't make it to Washington. So that's the way it is now. But that too is a product okay. of the change in the Senate. Okay. Because that altered uh, that altered tremendously the relationship of the states to the federal government. I see. Prior to 1912. Uh, you didn't just have losers going to state government because state government meant something. Mm. You see, I mean, it's it's if there's no if there's no power at the state level really, then then more uh, more ambitious people, which is not always a good thing, of course, will gravitate toward the federal. But if the state government really does mean something, then then they will they're likely to gravitate to the state and that is why amongst other things you've seen since the change of um, uh, since the change in the, in the constitution of the senate why the general level of state government has declined as well as the quality of the senators now there's an added problem and the added problem is this under the current system the senator is not responsible to a particular body, i.e. the government of the great state of California or Nevada or Illinois or Rhode Island. It is responsible to the population at large. Which means, unless it's a very small state like New Mexico, that in population, I mean, that they're really answerable to nobody. Because... You you can you may be able to get twenty percent of a congressman's uh, of a congressman's uh, uh, constituents to vote for a recall. It's really hard to get twenty percent of the people of the state to do it, as we found in, in trying to get rid of governors. There's a reason why it's only been done successfully once in California history. It's very hard to do it. Uh, the second uh, thing, of course, too is that while in Washington, the senator has no support, to, uh, no real support to fall back on. He has no, he can't say to a would-be lobbyist slash corrupter, well, I'd have to consult, uh, I'd have to consult Sacramento about that. And so, or, you know, he's, he's at once not answerable to anyone really but at the other, on the same, by the same token, he's unsupported, really. Whereas in the old system, he was, in a very real sense, the ambassador or co-ambassador of the, the great state of Illinois to the federal government, and that, and that also notice all the things uh, Supreme Court judges. All judges, all sorts of federal judges, cabinet members, <clears throat> all sorts of different positions of the government have to be approved by the Senate. Why is that? Well, it's because the Senate was supposed to be the state's watchdog on their creation, the federal government. But once you had popular election of the Senate, Effectively, that all well it became what we have now, mm. which is kind of a weird combination of uh, uh, matter and form. Anyway, suffice to say that uh, to move on to the uh, to the other question that uh, our friend had, who are my favorite senators? Well, firstly. The unholy trinity of our pre-war, or pre-Civil War antebellum senators, who were probably, although they often disagreed with each other, they were probably the most talented senators ever to hold office in the history of the United States. And they were Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, and John C. Calhoun. They would be my three favorite uh, U.S. senators. 
even though they disagreed with the, each other on different things. And they would sometimes gang up the two against the one. And that would vary. So it wasn't always the same two against the one. So you might have Webster and Clay gang up on Calhoun, Calhoun and Clay gang up on Webster, or Calhoun and Webster gang up on Clay. That is one takeaway I remember well from Puritan's Empire, is there's a lot of discussion yeah. on, on those three senators. But um, Well, yeah. they, were, they, were, they were very important because in a lot of ways, they set the standard and the style for the Senate to come. Now, if you were to ask me about later senators, uh, I'd say probably William Lemke of North Dakota, Gerald Nye of uh, Minnesota. I think it's Minnesota or South Dakota, one or the other. Our own Senate, Senator Hamilton Fish of New York State. You bet. <laughs> uh, what? I, I don't know what's behind that. It's just I, I haven't heard of Senator Hamilton Fish, so. Uh, Miss Goosey. Senator Hamilton Fish <laughs> was one of the leading opponents of Franklin Delano Roosevelt <laughs> in the United States Congress. And the fact that they sounded almost identical added to it. <laughs> All right. Enough said on that one. Okay, I get it. All right, you, you got that. And then, I guess, uh, if I were looking for others, I kind of like Huey Long uh, as a senator more than as a governor. Because, again, he really annoyed, uh, he really annoyed, um, what you call her, uh, FDR. Um, so, yeah, I'd say Huey Long in the Senate, but not as governor. Um not as governor at all. I, and then, okay. uh, what's that? But I, weren't all of his special innovations like as governor, though? You know, a lot of his special innovations. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Was the D -du the D -du the box. D-Duck box. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, that, that was, for those of, of us who aren't aware, when he was governor of Louisiana, one of the things uh, Huey Long did was he wildly expanded the salaries of all state employees and officials. But in every state office, there was a DDOT box into which you were expected to return a portion of your expanded salary. And the contents of the DDOT box then went back to Huey Long. I mean, that's... <laughs> I mean, to, to what extent are our entitlements nowadays just a different for, form of the d box? Now, see, you're not supposed to think along those lines. <laughs> see, all right, that is what we call, I mean, if ever I'd heard a hate thought, that's it. That is a hate thought. Right there. Right there. The minute you begin questioning entitlements, you should know that there's hatred in your heart. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, you should be. Okay, so Huey Long as a senator. Okay. As a senator. Okay. Not okay. We'll we'll just discard all that governor stuff. We'll just we'll just push it on the side. We'll just look so, the other way, <laughs> and and we'll forget the fact that as senator, although it was unconstitutional, <laughs> he used to go go back down to Baton Rouge and lead uh, meetings of the legislature. Wow. <laughs> Okay. We're gonna set that aside too. Okay. And we're gonna we're just gonna focus on him <laughs> as the senator in Washington, frightening the pants off Franklin Roosevelt. That's what we're gonna do. Okay, okay? there we go. Uh, yeah. Are we clear on this? <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens in Louisiana? So what happens in Baton Rouge stays in Baton Rouge. Ah, all right, understood. All right, I, I'm glad we have, we have that done. We have really, we really free ranged a lot on this uh, pre-show. That's the sign of a great pre-show. I think I'm going to make it public. Uh, we're at an hour and ten minutes. We've gone, we've really gone ham. Um, but I think we have to, we have to move on. 
to bigger and better things with the full episode. Ooh. How do you feel? Is about this that? cope? Is this cope? Well, I feel. I, is this cope? No, that that's we're, we're adulting, Charles, and as as cringe as that oh, might be, <laughs> it's very cringe. It's very cringe. I uh, I found a picture I, I just posted on uh, uh, Twitter. It shows you with the castle of Tuma in the back at night. And uh, my uh, my comment on it was, uh, dark academia has become my native habitat. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think. No, I think I, the... You're the poster boy of dark academia, academic. Like, you're, you're it. Really? Yeah. So by accepting the Aristotle Onassis Chair of <laughs> Clinical Lycanthropy <laughs> is... is, is that's part of it all? Is that what you're telling me? Is that, is that smack of dark academia to you? Is that how that sounds? That's over the top. <laughs> I, I shall endeavor to fulfill the, fulfill the requirements of this chair in accordance with the great men who have sat in it before me. God rest them all. Uh... <laughs> all right. Well, I guess we're going to have to move on to the actual show. Stay tuned. See you at the full episode, everyone. Take care.